This webinar is proudly brought to you by IG South Africa. Visit igmarkets.co.za to open your trading account today. So we're interesting a, a presentation, trading tips for beginners. Um, a couple of you said, is it only for beginners? No, it's not. It's probably for experts too. I frankly expect to learn something during the presentation as well. Uh, there will, as always, be some time for some questions afterwards. And we are, as always, recording. Uh, without further ado, Warren, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, trading tips for beginners. And as Simon is saying, now, it's not necessarily just for beginners. Uh, instead of making it like a point-by-point point presentation, I decided to start off with, you know, if, if I was going to start trading from scratch, how would I set out to do it in what I know today? And these were the five points that I, I found most crucial to, to learning. Uh, you know, when we start our trading, we've got this... Uh, we've got an idea of, of what it is. And very often, reality turns out to, to prove that idea really pie in the sky dreams. So I thought, well, let's put it this way. You know, if, if I was going to start out again, I would learn about trend. So for me, trend is, is the most important aspect of starting to trade. Most guys start out and they're trying to pick tops and bottoms. Uh, and it's, it's almost done intuitively. Uh, it's this human nature thing, you know, we don't want to be wrong, so if we can get it right at this point, you know, it'll go up from here, that kind of stuff. Uh, the reality is that the trend is actually going to gonna pull you through. Uh, there's a reason why the trend is your friend is a cliche. Uh, it's because it works. Uh, I would learn early on about position sizing and risk management. I would certainly learn how to backtest systems. I would build a system, uh, a strategy based on those systems. And then patience. Uh, yeah, everybody wants to get going. We just want to want to trade. You know, want to trade and trade and trade and trade. Uh, it, that would be more like gambling, and you're feeding an addiction to get stuff done instead of uh, sitting back and actually wanting to make money out of the market. So patience would be, uh, you know, all of the other stuff above requires patience for you to be successful at this. So let's start out looking at trends. Uh, the one thing is that trends can last for a very long time, and you can profit by trading the direction of the trend. In other words, you can be right five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times over a ten-year period, uh, or maybe even a shorter period when we look at some of the charts uh, shortly. Uh, when picking a turning point, you're only going to be right once, uh, and you might have tried it five or six times, and the market just keeps on going. Uh, I think the last sort of five, six years are are really important to go and have a look at this idea because the market was supposed to have topped out, I, I think it's about six times, so once a year. This is the top of the market, you know, all the experts are telling us. Uh, so a lot of people are going short at the top because if they get it right, it's going to be a lot of money. Uh, in the meantime, if you just bought the trend, uh, you would have been a lot better off. Once the trend is established, you can add to winning positions by finding shorter term entry points. So once that trend is in place, you can just keep adding and building a position if you are an investor or maybe a longer term trader. Uh, if you're a shorter term trader, you're going to be buying into the trend and selling it at some point and waiting for it to pull back and buying it again or maybe on a breakout. So once you can identify the trend and you understand what a trend really is, and that's momentum, you know, true long term momentum is what builds the trend. Uh, once you've sorted that out, you can figure out how to trade it and how to benefit from it. Trading the trend reduces stress levels. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, you don't have to try and guess what's going to happen next, <clears throat> excuse me, because the trend is in place. You don't have to try and pick turning points. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about whether you're right or wrong, because normally speaking, the trend will, will help you out of trouble. Okay, so you don't have to do a lot of guessing, uh, and that does reduce stress. When stress levels are reduced, you're actually able to be patient. Uh, it's when you're under stress that you're going to trade a lot, uh, and that's where patience goes out the window. And you can't argue with the trend. Uh, this is a long-term chart to Capitec. Okay, it starts back in 2009, right at the bottom. Now, I know you're going to tell me, oh, I didn't know it was going to be a trend at that point. Okay, but how about at this point? I think at that point you would have recognized that now the trend is in play, or at any next point. Okay, so at some point you can recognize the trend. All right, it is an extreme example, 
but these are the types of trends you want to catch. Yeah, these are the guys that will make up for all the other trends that don't work out. These long-term trenders will make up plus what you lose on those shares that don't actually go in that direction. Uh, then Capitech went for two and a half years or so yeah, into this consolidation. Uh, and the market wrote them off, you know, they're going to crash and Ebel and all the rest of it came into play and you know, these uh, these small lending companies just can't make it work, etc., etc., etc. Capitex fundamentals didn't really change during that time. Uh, so it was price action that changed. The actual company remained pretty strong and uh, management re remained upbeat. That doesn't mean you just go out and buy it. Okay, You can wait for something to happen that tells you when to buy it. Uh, the two green rectangles point out uh, two breakout areas. The first one is based on the blue trend line. Uh, it's not quite a triangle. It was you know, just a, a narrowing consolidation. Capitec broke out of it at that point. That was somewhere that you could have entered a small position uh, with the expectation, of course, that it's just going to go to the orange line and possibly hesitate. Uh, what it did, in fact, is break the orange line and then pulled all the way back to the blue trend line again. All right, and then it broke out for the third time. And of course, you don't buy it because, oh, you know, last time it didn't work. Uh, the whole idea is if you understand what your strategy does and where its failure points are, you can buy it the third, fourth, or even the fifth time. Uh, and again, it depends what you're trading. I think if you have a, a general knowledge of what fundamentals mean, you know, rather read the reports than listen to, to much news, okay, and, and guys just making comment on a company. Uh, the technicals will help you to time the trade. And you can see on Capitech, uh, most of you that have watched my webinars before know that I use the 21 and 89 moving averages exponential. Uh, you can see in that period there of two and a half years, the moving averages didn't work. That doesn't mean I just throw the stock out. Uh, it just means I stop trading 21.89 and wait for the consolidation to, to sort itself out. Uh, you'll also notice I didn't say that we can, you know, buy on support, okay, that's, that's also not the best way to do things initially, uh, especially with all the uncertainty going on. We don't know what's coming next, so we waited for the breakout. Uh, initial breakout, position one, second breakout, position two, stop loss could have just been put at the bottom of the consolidation. Okay, so please keep your thinking independent of what you read in the newspapers and, and potentially here on the news. Okay, so Capitec is an extreme example, but it's a really good example of patience. If you had just waited for the consolidation to complete, uh, you would have been quite happy with this trade so far. Uh, position sizing. That's a really important, I think all five points are really important. Uh, but position sizing is what can make or break an account. Okay, so it is a really important part of any trading or investing plan. By taking a smaller position, you can trade more instruments. So you could trade uh, yeah, more than just two, two shares. You could possibly trade four or six just by reducing your average position size. Or you can have less risk in the beginning of a trade and add into strength. So as Capitec is going up, for instance, you may, might have bought, uh, yeah, let's say, 150 shares in the beginning, and then the second time is another 150 and so on, and you would add into strength until your entire position has been filled and you then leave it to run uh, with the trend. Your position sizing allows you to really capture the trend. Uh, it's all nice and good and well to look at the chart and say, well, if I just put you know, a million rand in at that point, I would have made so much money. Uh, you had to sort of ride out the drawdown first. You know, The market went up, broke up, then it broke back into the consolidation, then it broke up again, then it pulled back into the consolidation. So if you had put a million rand straight in there, uh, and it was all the money you had, you would have been probably shaken out as the market traversed, and then you wouldn't have been able to put the balance back in. Whereas if you had a million rand and you had put, let's say, 50,000 on the first breakout, you would have been able to hold the drawdown by controlling your position sizing and your risk. Keep your trades or your ads in equal size so that you can get used to the idea of proper sizing. You know, Try and keep it at 150 shares, 150 shares, 150 shares for Capitec, uh, or work it out on, on cash. You know, I'd rather have just 
uh, let's say 20,000 Rand exposure per trade. So if I'm buying physicals, I'm going to buy 20,000 worth. If I'm buying CFDs, I'm going to buy 20,000 worth. When you get good at it, you then play with your sizing. The last thing you want to do up front is change your sizing every week. Uh, that just doesn't allow you uh, time to settle into your strategy. And then really critical part would be do not double your size because of a few winning trades. Um, my time as a, as a trading coach has shown me this many times over. Uh, somebody will start out trading whatever it is from a physical share all the way through to highly leveraged uh, commodities. They make two, three, four, five good trades and then suddenly they double, triple or quadruple their trade size and all that's really happened is that you had a good spell. Uh, you caught maybe a shorter term trend uh, or maybe you even caught a long term trend now the trend has changed and you're just suddenly going to climb in there and of course that's the losing trade and it eats all the profit that you made on your winners. So please don't just willy nilly increase your position size, do it incrementally, slowly over time as you get better at it, uh, as you get better at trading you'll get better at position sizing. Uh, risk goes hand in hand with, with sizing. Risk is the amount of money that you prepare to, to lose on a trade as a stop loss. Uh, it is also all of your trade stop losses added up to a total risk on your account capital. Uh, and please note that it's not 2% on the share price or the currency rate or whatever. If it's 2% of capital per trade is the rule of thumb. Uh, with 10% of your total account at risk at any one time. Remember this is aimed at starters. Guys who started early, if I had followed these rules I would have been a lot happier person in the first three or four years of trading. So keep your risk down uh, and use that 2% of capital to calculate your position size. Uh, just remember that most of these things are covered somewhere on just one lap or on the Traders Place website in webinars. Uh, if you do want to know which specific ones, just pop me an email and I'll tell you which ones you can go and watch. So with 10% of total capital at risk, you can have five trades at a time. And again, it's going to depend on your leverage as well. Uh, if you're trading currencies or you're trading commodities, you're actually not going to risk that much of your capital per trade. So this is really aimed at shares uh, and share CFDs. As your capital goes, you can reduce the 2% at risk, which will enable even more positions. So it's, it's a very different scenario having 2% of a million rand at risk versus 2% of 10,000 rand at risk. Okay, so as your capital grows and you get good at this, you, you might just reduce that 2% down to 1% or in some instances half a percent of capital. Okay, just a little example on, on sizing and risk on discovery. I just used a 100,000 account, a uh, nice round number. Trade one, moving averages crossed over. So we buy in discovery over there. So the EMA is crossed over and it broke that little trend line. So downward sloping trend line, breaks above that, trade one is entered. The initial stop is the red line at the swing low there. Uh, that risk is eight rand. In other words, from my entry price to where my stop loss is, is eight rand. If I work that back into the 2% of a 100,000 rand account, uh, I get a 2,000 rand stop loss. I divide the eight rand into the 2,000 rand, I get 250 shares. Uh, this is a conservative way to manage sizing. Okay. Uh, the stop is trailed as the price goes in your direction. We can see discovery moved towards its resistance level and then it gave us these two, uh, two little swing lows and the trend line is put in place. The price breaks below that. The position can be closed uh, or if, if this is not 2% risk but let's say half a percent risk, you might have held on a bit longer. Uh, and when discovery broke either above the ultimate resistance level or back above the initial breakout level, you could have added or bought a second time. So trade number two is where the EMA is crossed over there, but it was very close to initial resistance. You could have just waited for the break to occur at that point. In other words, you don't have to buy at a resistance level. The stop again is the red line at the bottom, uh, just below the orange support level. And that was a 7 Rand risk, so 2% of capital at risk is 2,000 Rand divided by uh, 7 Rand and you could have bought 285 shares on the breakout. 
So the trend is in play, and if you had gone to longer time frame on a weekly, you'll see that the 21.89 didn't cross on the weekly, but did cross on a daily. If you were a longer term investor, uh, you wouldn't be trading the, the daily chart anyway, you'd be trading based on the weekly chart using the daily chart to add to winning trades. Uh, if you're a shorter term trader, then you'd be doing something similar to what I'm, what I'm speaking about here. On the back testing side, um, you know, <laughs> this is where I get the most resistance. Okay, because back testing is quite a painstaking exercise if you've got 30 or 40 shares to look at. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, to back test the system, you actually have to know what that system's entry points are, what its stop losses are, what its potential uh, targets are, in other words, prices that can be achieved during the trend. You need to know your exits in a profit and you need to know position sizing. Am I going to add to the trend or am I just going to put one trade on? Uh, it all makes a difference. So before you can backtest the system, you require a system. So if you just took the 21 and 89 exponential moving average crossover, you could go and apply that to a whole range of shares. And it's pretty simple. When 21 crosses above 89, you buy. 21 crosses below 89, you close out the, close out the trade. You can take that and you can go and backtest Discovery and Capitec and a few other other uh, shares out there, and that will tell you what that system makes or loses over time. Uh, three to five years is normally a good, you know, good um, backtesting time frame, okay? But it is a, it's not a very popular exercise, but it's really critical because the backtesting tells you what your system can and can't do. I know that when Capitec went sideways, my 2189 is not going to work. I know that. I've tested it. I've traded it. Uh, in the beginning, I back-tested it. I know that it doesn't work in sideways markets. So as soon as I can see that the market's going sideways, moving averages out the window. Then we start looking for chart patterns, consolidations, breakouts. Uh, using your system's rules, you can look at years of data and measure that system's performance. In other words, you can look at a lot of trades over a longer period of time and let's say on Capitec, it might only take you 10 minutes, but if you wanted to do, let's say, currencies, uh, it's going to take you an hour or so uh, per time frame. So if you start on the daily, that might take you an hour. If you do the four hourly, that might take you an hour and so on. And you have to do that for each instrument that you trade. Okay, so it's quite important to, to know what your system does, what its entries and exits are. And then it's really important to go find instruments that work really well on that strategy. Okay, this allows you to have confidence in the system. Before you even start trading, you know what the system is capable of. And once you know that, when you do start trading, you'll have confidence in yourself. You'll know that, you know what, over time, the system works so I can hold my trades a bit longer. I don't have to you know, actively trade this thing every, every third or fourth day. Okay, so I can just leave the trend to run. An example of a back test. I just did a really simple one on Aspen. Um, uh, trade number one is the, the first green circle. And the exit on that is the red circle over there. That returned uh, 157 Rand per share profit. So if you had bought it on the crossover at the exit price there, you would have made 157 Rand a share. Then the second trade came in uh, literally a couple of weeks later. Okay, with the 21 crossed above the 89. That one is currently still in play, and it's up 100 in the share. Um, that's two trades, zero losses. It doesn't mean it'll work forever like that. But what this does do is it allows you to, to look at trading the breakout if you're not in it. Uh, if you are in it, you can manage your stop loss. So let's have a look at the breakout uh, history on the stock. So if we take it from 2012, uh, 2012's entry, Sorry, from the 20, first breakout there in 2012, that one. Uh, it continued moving higher. It didn't really pull back into the zone. That one also broke out and continued to move higher. Pulled back, didn't come back below the orange line. Broke out again, and so it went until that point. So here we see Aspen starting to go into quite difficult trading, uh, and it was pretty difficult trading Aspen between 2013 and 2014. Uh, because every time it broke up, it would break out, as you can see over here, and then it pulls back in below the, the support level. Finds resistance, the average is crossover, you close out your longer term trade, 
and then you enter the next trade and so it goes. Then it breaks above resistance again over here and pulls back below what that old resistance that now support. And then Aspen did it again over here. It broke out. It moved quite a bit higher and then pulled back into the... So this makes trading a little bit more difficult. Now, it doesn't mean you stop trading it, but certainly you consider after, after the second one especially, you consider just reducing your size uh, and seeing what happens and when Aspen starts to actually take off again. Okay, systems. Using that above backtest example, you can build a clean and simple trading system as follows. For the longs, enter position one at the moving average crossover, add on a resistance line break, then trail the stop to the new support level. So once the resistance level is broken, the previous support can become support. Uh, sorry, can become the stop. Uh, close the position on an EMA crossing down or a support level break. I don't think you can get any simpler than that. And you would just use your account size to, to calculate your uh, position sizes and how much you prepare to risk. Right, patience. To be patient, we need a deep, felt knowledge of the system and its potential. We have to feel the system, not just know it. It's got to be a part of your psyche. It's got to be a part of your makeup. That when, when that system fires a signal, you know exactly what to expect. And it's not really what's going to happen next. You know, the price is going to go up or down. That's not the point. But if it does fail, I know how much I'm going to lose. And if it does work, I know how to hold the trade. We need to know the system's failures as well as its strengths. So moving averages work really well when a stock is moving, when an instrument is moving in a direction consistently. But it will fail when the market goes into sideways consolidation. Or the stock, uh, you know, long-term averages will go out of fashion when the stock goes into large swings. Only when we know as much as possible about what we're doing can we be patient. You cannot be patient if you don't have a proper system that you fully understand. Uh, being patient works on all sides of a trade. We have to wait for the signal to enter. When we get when we get the signal, then we have to make the trade. And then we have to wait for the trade to work or fail according to the criteria. And only after waiting can we actually execute. So you, you might wait years, in the case of Aspen, for a trade. You have to wait. And when the time comes, you have to be there to take the trade. Once you're in the trade, you have to wait for the trade to finish. So in other words, you could wait, let's say, two years, and then there's five seconds to, to trade, and then you're done for another year or two. Okay, so you do need some patience. Well, you need a lot of patience. Uh, patience, when waiting for an ad, uh, you have to be patient on the initial sizing of the trade. So if you want to add to a trade, then you have to know your position sizing, and we can't just take... 10,000 uh, shares and then not be able to add again. Or if we do add, we end up exceeding the risk uh, available to us on the account. Doing this means we have no reason to panic into or out of the trade because we know when and why we are going to enter and exit. So that that sizing, if, if I'm going to add to the trade, I know exactly when and how I'm going to do it and how many shares I'm going to do it with. Therefore, I have very little stress on the trade. So the more that you can, the more you understand your system, the simpler it is going to become to trade. And make sure that the system fits your personality and your goals, of course. So in other words, once we do all of this, we trade with a lot less emotional stress. Doing all of the above means that our trading plans are clean and simple. It allows us to relax while we trade. And it means it becomes simpler to hold winning trades and exit losing trades, because that's the goal. Okay, so holding the winning trade—that's what we're all trying to do. And you've read it in all the books and every trader that you've spoken to. You've got to hold your winning trade, but you have to know how to do that. Okay, and exit losing trades. It's not just about stop loss. When that trade is in a profit, you still have to close it to to bank the profit. Okay, so that's what all of the above points mean is I get to the point where it's simple to trade, I can hold my winners, and I can close any losing trades, whether it's on a stop or in a profit. And that is the ultimate trading or investing goal, uh, in my opinion anyway. Uh, that's what I set out to do every, every day, uh, trade clean and simple. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that webinar.
Thanks, Warren. Folks, if you've got questions, pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, I've got a couple coming through. Let me just check. Is my audio? Yep, my audio is working. A, a question from Denver, and, and he's saying, he says unrelated. It, it is, but it isn't. He says, which is better in terms of costs between single stock futures and CFDs? Um, I'll give my five cents and I'll throw it to Warren. CFDs are typically a bit uh, cheaper. Um, and in some cases only marginally so, some cases a little bit more, but they're, they're more complex in terms of understanding the pricing structures and the like. The CFD, you're trading at a, usually you're trading at that spot price, so you can see the price, and you pay your interest daily, and then single stock futures have got rollover costs. So if you've got the March contract when it expires uh, on the third Thursday, which will be next week, the 19th, you're going to have a cost of rolling into the next contract where CFDs don't expire. Warren, any any thoughts further on that, or does that kind of fit in? Uh, that's perfect for stocks. Uh, we do have some discrepancies on index CFDs, for instance. Um, yeah, good point. Can be more expensive to trade than the uh, the Aussie contract. Yeah, fair point. Okay, so yeah. it depends what you're trading. Uh, with forex as well, you know, you're trading CFDs or you're trading spreads or whatever. So. There are differences per instrument. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, Denver, you were asking stock specific, but uh, as Warren says, certainly for FX and others, uh, yeah. in, in, in the in the future space, if you're trading an index, it's usually cheaper to go the the, the route of the of, of a futures rather than a, a CFD. Uh, Craig, does trend following work in shares exactly the same as other instruments like forex and commodities, Warren? If you can find the right share. Uh, like the ones I looked at today, they've they've been awesome trenders. Uh, and Nuspass is another one that's done well, and uh, Coronation did well. Uh, Coronation's just you know falling over at the moment, but uh, so they they can. Uh, forex the forex can trend 12 to 18 months in general. That's what I'm looking to, time wise. Mm -hmm. Shares can trend for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, because right. forex is not uh, it's not a zero game. You know, a share is not going to go back to zero if it's a good quality company. Uh, and the currency is not going to, it'll go from parity to double back to parity, maybe a bit below. You know, it's, it's, it's a swinger, but yeah. it swings over huge uh, periods of time. A follow-up question from, from Craig as well is, are shares more risky than others in perhaps indices, commodities, or, 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 or FX? Where, where would you position it as a risk process? If you take, okay, this is, Uh, yeah, this is my favorite topic of all time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're trading physical stocks, that's probably the lowest sort of risk you, you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you take an index, let's take the Aussie at 400,000 Rand uh, exposure. That 400,000 Rand put into a share CFD uh, is a far greater risk than the 400,000 put on the Aussie. Uh, you know, a share can fall three or can move three to five percent in a day, um, whereas the all these it can do it, but it's, it does it less often, and it's highly unlikely that it's going to do it. You know, three weeks in a row. So from if you take it rand for rand, I think that the share CFD is a higher risk because of the the inherent volatility of a stock. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'd look at the indices as the second riskiest. And the lowest risk for me is, is forex. Uh, forex doesn't move one percent in a day. Yeah. Actually, unless the Swiss franc, you know, it moves thirty percent in ten minutes. The problem with the Swiss franc, but that is a that was a hundred times <laughs> that, that, That's what really, really hurt. And that really was. I mean, you know, I remember that happened in the yen once, but that was like thirteen years ago. This is not a common occurrence. Yep. And as I say, that probably every currency in the world is. That's not a common it's thing not, at all. But it's not common. And, yeah. You know. What most people don't take into account is the exposure that you're taking. If you take the 400,000 Rand example, because that's what the Aussie is, yeah. and you put that 400,000 all into the Swiss franc, you would have been hammered. Okay. But your account should be safe if you were following the proper rules. You wouldn't have lost your account just because you had 400,000 in the, in the Swiss franc, or Euro Swiss franc, for instance. No, fair point. Yeah, it was exposure value. So therefore, to me, currencies are the lowest risk if you take exposure across the board. 
John, I see your question around indicators for the Aussie. I'm going to pass the buck on this one because we're, we're running over time. And I can say go check justonelap.com. Warren has published Aussie trading systems as well as others. Just head over there and, and uh, type in, in the search box. Put in Aussie. You'll find Warren's trading system for that. Uh, question from Stefan, a, a bit beyond, but let's quickly throw it out there because it's interesting. He says he uses 21 and 89 EMAs to determine trend. Um, in other words, 21 above is up, 21 below is down. Stochastic turning uh, as his buy signal. Is there anything to better improve uh, timing entry? Or so trend is 21 and 89 EMAs, and then stochastic for the for the actual signal. Your thoughts on that, Warren? Uh, yeah, that's that's basically the the, the trend fishing system. Yeah. Uh, the way that you improve that is adding candle patterns for uh, for triggers. Uh, and having a look at support and resistance, and the overall look of the chart. You know, if if a share has made a lower high, but the averages are still pointing up, I, I find it difficult to then just buy because the stochastic says so. So I'd like to trade that system as the moving averages have crossed up. In other words, in the first half of the trend. Uh, you don't know which is the first half, okay? But you know, as that trend matures, I reduce my sizes uh, as the risk increases. Gotcha. I don't know if that helps. Too yeah, much. No, that makes perfect sense. And I, and I hear what you're saying. It's stochastic. I mean, it, it, it works, but it's a bit of a blunt instrument in a sense. Uh, ladies and gents, we're going to leave it there because we've run out of time. Apologies about, uh, well, internet dying. I have wonderful backups, but they're not uh, sort of points, five second switchovers. It usually works better. We'll leave it there. Uh, Warren, really appreciate. Uh, I have recorded. Let's hope recording worked. I'll know that in the next 10 minutes or so. But uh, ladies and gents, thanks for your time today. Warren, all the best. Thanks, man. Thank you. You too. Cheers, guys. Cheers, all. This webinar is proudly brought to you by IG South Africa. Visit igmarkets.co.za to open your trading account today.